conditioners. Just what you need to cool down this soaring week. Need somewhere to relax while staying cool with Omni? Then shop again in our furniture gallery. Now offering up to 60% discounts on all furniture. No cash, no problem. We offer zero down payment with great payment plans of up to 36 months. Easy, flexible, and affordable. Feel the difference. Feed the heat and stay comfortable with Omni. Omni is having a 15% store-wide sale on cash purchases, excluding phones and laptops. 30% off store-wide on credit, excluding phones and laptops. Power 102.7 just keeps on coming. Special guest with your host, Lady Grace. Now let's get started. That's a very nice touch to it, eh? A nice touch. <laughs> get you in the mood for the holidays. That's the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We won't allow politics overshadow our Christmas, right? But anyhow, good morning again to you, St. Martin Samatin, and uh, of course to my online listeners and Facebook viewers on uh, my guest this morning on your Facebook page. Uh, joining me this morning in the breakfast lounge, nice to have him back. He's my Wednesday child because in every election, he always makes sure he's here on a Wednesday. Deputy leader and the number two candidate of the now party, Mr. Claudius Bon Camper. Good morning to you. Morning, Grace. Uh, to you and the radio listeners and those that are following me on Facebook also and the streams. A pleasant good morning to one and all. All right, nice to have you here. Now, first and foremost, let's go right at it. I know you uh, you have your podcast. You're also now streaming on YouTube also. You're a busy man, eh? Um, my <laughs> daughter's helping me with th those logistics. Yeah. I, I am not that well versed in it, right, so I, remember, I learn every day. Yeah, because I remember when you first came here a few years ago, and um, you actually were just like, oh, how do I go live? How do I do this? But you seem to be an expert now at it. <laughs> the live, yes. <laughs> Professional. <laughs> Anyhow, um, MP, let's talk about last week and, um, well, you weren't too happy with the verdict which was rendered and you decided to send it to the appeal to the higher court in the Netherlands. Let, let, let's, uh, let's discuss that a bit for uh, some, some folks who probably didn't see it on your Facebook page and your podcast. So um, you can probably share that with us. I know you weren't too pleased about it because you were very confident that when you went into this, uh, when it was going to court last week, actually you were confident that the, the judge would actually throw the case out. But unfortunately, it was, uh, yeah, okay. it didn't go as you let me just take it let me, take let me take a deep breath, um, Grace, because what I'm going to say is going to ripple the water today. I, I can guarantee that. I am sure that... There will be repercussions, most probably, for what all I'm going to say and how I'm going to say. But when I heard the verdict, it didn't really sink in correctly until I read the verdict with my lawyer. And I will boldly state here today, and this is for everybody to know, corruption goes right up the ladder in the justice system. No ifs and buts about this anymore. You see, Joe, Grace, when I can say this confidently, I can prove it. The lawyer defended my case the way it had to be defended. And Grace, I have no issue if the judge, the three judges actually, not a judge, three judges would have used the law, the evidence to tell me that what my lawyer said was not correct and was wrong. We told them that I didn't get a fair trial. They said, yes, you did. Because you were heard when you were being tried by the appeals court to be prosecuted. That's a blatant lie. But it's written in the verdict. That I was shown the documents. That's a blatant lie. I have the verklaring of my lawyer, Mr. Bloom, who we handed it into court, clearly stated what went down. Then they say that... Um, I gave the contract to Roberto and Sons, the two little black boys from Soccer Garden over the multinational with the roads. I was the red thread. And I'm going to explain in detail just now. I'm going to call all the names of who were involved so that everybody understands. 
Claudius Tungchuban Camper wrote an advice where I was stating, based on the outcome of the tender, the logical choice, which was a financially based choice of 2.3 million guilders, was the way to go, and not 3.8 million as the other tender had offered the government per year. This was a, going to be a two-year contract with an option of a third year, so there was a difference of 1.5 million guilders per year. This is what it was. When you look at the verdict, they said, no, Mr. Bancamper approved the contract. Mr. Bancamper on his own either convinced, manipulated, threatened, whatever they want because they don't say what it is. I forced my SG, Mr. Lewis Brown, to approve it. I forced the financial controller from Vromi to approve it. Your signature was done on the advice. And my well, signature no, 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 was on the, nothing. My signature is on the advice as the department head. Okay. The approval signatures mm -hmm. on the advice was that of Lewis Brown, that of the minister of Vromi then, Mr. Myers, the finance head which I believe was, uh, I'm not sure. I know the Secretary General of Finance, Mr. Pales, he also signed it. The Minister of Romy signed it. The Minister of Finance signed it. The Council of Ministers approved it in their meeting and then sent on the draft contract with a national decree to the Governor, Dr. Anders Eugene Holliday, whom reviewed it, checked it, back-checked it, turned it inside out with his cabinet, and then agreed, okay, it is good. It meets the criteria of how a tender should be done based on the regulations that we have. And it was approved. That was then sent back. Mr. Myers then called in the contractors and signed the contract with Robelto and Sons. Mm -hmm. Where did I sign? No place. Where did I approve? No place. All I did was make an advice and send the advice through the proper channels as regulated in government to be approved. And it was approved by the competent authorities I just mentioned. For whatever reason, the judges felt that is not relevant, but Kampa did it. Bottom line. You were the I, orchestrator, basically. I saying. was the orchestrator and approver. Mm -hmm. Because I can orchestrate whatever I want. I just gave you all the different entities from the secretary generals, the financial controllers, the finance department, the ministers, the council of ministers, and the governor, all of them have controlling mechanisms. How no is it that nobody, no, absolutely not. They didn't want to hear from nobody. Mr. Brown was heard. Mr. Brown explained what happened. Mr. Pales wrote a letter, but they didn't care. It wasn't about the evidence. It was about the verdict. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about, okay, let's see what really transpired here. No, it was about that was said. And that's it. They used that Mr. Myers, when he was minister, stated Ban Camper was jockeying for Roberts and Sons to get a contract. No, Ban Camper was jockeying that the advice that I wrote was based on factual statements and evidence in the tender. And for such, we granted to the one that won. I didn't want to give an additional 1.5 million that we didn't have in the budget. Are you saying then that the verdict is basically based on hearsay? More than here, see, because the minister Myers signed the same advice to grant the contract. The minister signed the contract. So if it was all so bad as he stated by the TBO, then why did he sign? So either all of them were accomplices with me, all of them were incompetent. They can choose whichever one they want. But I don't believe the governor is incompetent. Why are you being targeted, though? I mean, if in your position, actually, you actually said you had a written advice, an advice that in your position, then, when you were actually at Vromi, that that was yeah. your job, all you do, you submit an advice, and then the, the rest, of, well, basically, your boss, uh, Ms. Mr. Brown, for example, and the minister then, who was minister of Vromi, Mr. Myers, are the ones who actually have to approve your Correct. advice, and that was rendered, it was done. If they didn't agree with it, they could have sent it back. Right. And so we don't agree with it. But how, I still try to figure out, though, Mr. Van Camper, how did you get caught up in, all, in, in this mess, though? Very simple. Very, very simple. 
You see, in St. Martin, melee plays a big role. You have to go back to my first case, Bimu. You know, I was trying to keep you out of office. Oh, there's a collusion to do that with government and other players. No ifs and buts about that. Remember the first case I won it in Supreme Court. In 2018, October, there was a verdict rendered by the appeals court and I got a conditional center, um, sorry, a community service center and a fine. And I said, absolutely not. I'm going to appeal because I did nothing. And four years later, I won. I won that appeal. They were so mad because they told my lawyer in June, we come and free him again. Oh. And in November of 2018, they searched my office, my house, and my wife's office. They came in and searched again. And they decided not to try me or charge me mm -hmm. until I was elected. What was uncovered uh, during the search? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing that you can say, I did this. What they do is they take information and they start to twist it and turn it. That's one of the th reasons that you have to be very careful when you give a testimony. Because when you give a testimony by a judge of instruction, you can, your lawyer reads it and then they sign for approval. When you give a statement in courts, there is no review. The court recorder writes what is said. That's what you hope for. But in our case, it was abundantly clear. The court recorder wrote what needed to be written to ensure that the verdict could be made. Because all of us objected to the statements that were written in on November 12th, 2021, when the statements were given, the 27th, the 28th, and 29th of September. A month and a half later, they reached at quarter past six in the afternoon, two days or two weekend days before trial, and tell us these are the statements. And then tell us the statements stand because that's what they heard. That's why I said, when I, I can remember there was a story, Jumbi in the courthouse. There had to be a Jumbi in the courthouse because a judge jumped up and said, he heard Babadu Flanders say, he gave me 188,000 guilders. He heard that in court. And that's why it's written in the statement. And I said, this is utter, utter BS. Seriously, it's inadmissible in court. He became, he, he fabricated the, 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 the so-called evidence there and then in the statement. That's what the judge did. Mm -hmm. And we were able to expose this. He then went into a whole rigmarole with emails between my lawyer and himself saying, okay, we're going to postpone the trial to December. Then he says, no, 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 we're going to keep the trial Monday and Tuesday because whatever Flanders said is irrelevant to Bunkamper's trial because Bunkamper is tried separately from Mr. Flanders. Even though we were all tried together, we were all tried separately because there was no what they call a vooking. There was no combining of right, the evidence. Right. Okay. And if they had decided to do that, they would have given us more time. Okay, so well, you're talking about two different cases here then. There were four cases, four in, cases one case. in one case. The one from Mr. Lapin, from Mr. Flanders, from myself and my wife. There right. were four. We were all tried together, but yet independently. Mm -hmm. So whatever my wife said or Lapin said or Flanders said could not be used in my case. Okay. And what I said could not be used in their, in their case, case, vice right. versa. But that didn't happen because when you read the first verdict, clearly what was said in the statements of La Paix and Flanders and my wife and me were used in my verdict. You can't use things that I'm telling you I never said. Yet they did. But it doesn't stop their grace. In the appeals, the Solicitor General said that while I was acquitted in first instance for the Kim Shah misusing my power, mm -hmm. he said no, he wants to appeal the aspect of the contract that was signed with MP Emmanuel, then minister. Grace, in my verdict of appeals, there's no mention of this whole charge. The charge is not there. There is no verdict on the charge. Because an intern wrote this. Somebody who was not part of this trial wrote that verdict. I don't care what the judges think about what I'm saying. When you see those mistakes at that level, there is intent. I don't care what people think. And they won't come at me. They know where I live. But I want to start talking now what's really happening in this country. I told the minister of Frumi sometime back when they had a trial and he was pounding his chest. Oh, 
a great victory for Samantha. I said, you are missing the verdict. The current minister. Current minister of Rome, yes. I said, you are missing the verdict. You are rejoicing that Vineyard Heights, um, Myers um, did it wrong. Mm -hmm. But what you are missing is what the judge is doing. The judge is telling you that you can't decide certain things anymore until you do A, B, C, D. That's not her job. That's the job of parliament. Policies and laws are made, initiated by government or parliament. When a judge starts to sit on the seat of government, then you just threw three as politicas through the window. Mm -hmm. And this government got to wake up and smell the aroma. This is what you call modern day colonization. They use the justice system to keep you down. They use the finances they give you to keep you in check. That's what's happening. And I spoke out about it from day one mm -hmm. when we had the new criminal code. I told them you can't do certain things. I was vehemently against it. So was MP Rolando Bryson. You see, they went kicking his door too. Yeah. Say so he do all kind of things. They arrested him and held him. Once you object to their rule of law, you're going to go to jail. And that's what you feel right now is happening. I'm living it. I'm living it for the past 13 years. <clears throat> I was a fellow. I wasn't afraid to tell you no. Still, you're still I, I ain't afraid to call you out either. And I'm not afraid of a fight. I'm not going to bend the knee or bend my head to them. If that's what they're hoping for, please don't hold your breath. But you, you, know, you know, MP, the more, the more you talk out, you speak out about it, it, it seems that it does more, more harm than good for you too. Why? Because I'm telling the truth. If I'm telling the truth and that's what I'm going to be punished for, then c'est la vie. Then c'est la vie. I am writing an article it's called Judges versus Justice. I'm going to ensure it's published in the Netherlands because that's where they pay them. I need them to know what's happening in their colonies across the Atlantic because this is not justice. I don't have a problem if I am convicted for something I did properly showing me the evidence and all that. Don't tell me that what I did with using the plant, the sewage plant money to do works. You're saying, oh, I enriched the Lions Club. The Lions Club is a civic organization in this country for the past 52 years. I asked permission to fix the shelter that it is. Oh, but you falsified the bill. I said, no, I followed the procedures that the government told me I should follow. For that, I am punished. This is crazy. And then in the judgment, they tell me, oh, but the lady, the financial controller, Mrs. Kelly, who did the, in the um, review of all the documents on behalf of the Secretary General of Finance, Mr. Pales? Oh, no, but she wasn't here when it happened. Because what I'm being charged for happened 11 years ago. What I was sentenced for happened 11 years ago. Oh, she wasn't here that time. But the documents are there in the files. The same documents you got, she checked. Showing and put in writing, heard by the TBO in Curacao, no, but this is what it is. This is what it was. Oh, no, but that's not good because she wasn't there. So you had to be there to be part of it. Yet you use statements of all other people that were not there to say it was so. You know, so when it's convenient for them, they do what they want. Look, at the end of the day, it's very simple for me. I was convicted based on innuendos, made-up stories, not proof, because if there was proof, the three judges would have used the proof to justify the verdict. They didn't. My first instance, my verdict was 80 pages. My second appeal, nine pages, mm -hmm. of which three quarters was copy and paste. Okay. So there was nothing of substance. My lawyer brought in 120 pages of defense. Nothing was good. Nothing was true. You're appealing. You said it to Kassati, exactly, right? and there they're going to look if the Bowais lost. So if the judge, the judges, use proper evidence to justify their verdict. How, how long will this take? This can take years. Because it's for, the, the, the system is, now we appeal. That, that, that appeal goes to Curacao. Curacao, the, uh, the prosecutor general sends it to Holland. Right. In the meantime, we how get... How much weight does that carry, though, when you send it to the appeals court in the Netherlands? Because... 
usually, in, in some cases, you see that once the, the, the verdict is rendered, they just take and they look at it and they just send it back and say, okay, you all rendered the verdict already. What, what? No, 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 it doesn't work. So the you know, appeal courts doesn't do that. Appeal courts, when you... So appeal, they basically go through the, the whole... They, 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 two, things happen. Two, two things two, happen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Two things happen. Right. First, you have to write an advice. So okay. a lawyer in Holland, we are now busy with the lawyers in Holland to write the advice. They're going to first tell you, do you stand the chance to do this? Okay. If you stand the chance, they will normally take your case. Because lawyers don't like to lose if they know up front they go to lose. So they will take your case and they'll present it. All indications are already that the whole inadmissibility, the abuse of power, the abuse of equality of arms... That alone will throw this case out, that the verdict can't stand. And that's what we anticipated would have happened in appeal too. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reasons, they just swung around that by saying, no, I got the documents afterwards anyway. So what do you mean you didn't get the documents? We gave them to you two years later. You had them. In the meantime, though, I was prosecuted. Or the right to prosecute me was given when it shouldn't have been given because I never got the documents. So again, there are a lot of um, legalities that now will start um, taking place and right. it's going to take a while. Right. But I need to clarify something because in the Herald last week, they wrote that I was sentenced to an unconditional prison sentence of 32 months and I was banned from holding office for Public three years. Office for the next three years. That's a blatant lie. They have the verdict. They have it. This is the second time that the Herald comes at the now party. First it was Mr. Olivier owns the party and he's sponsoring the party and he's Chris's advisor. You explained last I explained week. last week, blatant lie, bunch of BS. Now they come and they write this on Friday after the verdict. And then on Tuesday after I make noise, mm -hmm. they write a little rectification on page three. Right. Maybe you can read it. I see the correction here. It says, uh, it reads as follows, and I quote, on the Friday, December 1st edition of the Daily Herald, it was erroneously stated that Claudius von Camper was banned from holding public office for the next three years. Instead, he is banned for seven years from being a civil servant. The Daily Herald apologizes for any inconvenience caused. I have been busy, and today is the fifth day, mm -hmm. explaining to people that what was written is false. It's part of the collusion. Why do I say that? I wrote an article because the Herald asked me, do you want to tell your story? I said, sure, I would love to. This was after the verdict. After the verdict, after right. we started the discussion about the wrongful reporting. Correct. They said, okay, send us your story. So I send them a story, judges versus justice. Mm -hmm. And I explained in there, sending them the emails, correspondence between the judge and my lawyer. Who wrote the story? This story? Yeah. Jacqueline Hofstad. Okay. And she told me, no problem, send it to me. So I sent it, I said, did you get it? Yes, she got it. Then she sends me back a story. She said, I adjusted your story. And I said, okay, do you approve this story? Mm -hmm. And the story headline is Bon Camper confident he can win a seat in the parliamentary so election. Read it. No, no, she said. Okay. She sent me that story to see if I approve it. Right. That's what I said. So, so I told her. I said, but this is not the story. This is not what I sent you. I sent you a story showing corruption in the justice system. You are sending me a story about I confident I can win my seat. That's not the story I sent you. So you know you have no right to publish anything on my behalf. Mm -hmm. Just make the correction. Right. I said, but why don't you want to publish the story? Or the editor said, it's going to take up too much space in the newspaper. So it is not important that I come out with a story telling you what I believe happened in courts, but you only take the side of what they tell you happened. But then you're as biased as they come. And you call yourself a media. That means you're a tarnished media. Yes, I said it now. Because that's what I feel it is. I, I, I can't go around it. I gave them the story. I gave them the evidence of what I was saying. You have a copy of that story. Oh, hell yes. It's, co it's coming out. Okay. It's going to be published in the Netherlands. Maybe when the Telegraph writes it, they're going to write it. Because that's what they do. That's what they do. They copy and paste, like some of the others here too. Then you get another one stating that I can't sit in Parliament. Because Article 50 might have didn't change. 
see, the law is a difficult thing to understand when you don't read Dutch. They translate it for you, and yet you don't understand it. That's a pity. Because the law states that if you are convicted while you're in the process, mm -hmm. and you um, are holding office and the conviction is more than a year, you'll be automatically suspended and somebody else will be put in your place and they will step down with everybody else at the end of the term. That article, before you continue, hold your word there, that article only applies in St. Martin. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. We're so, the only so, fools that have it in the Constitution. Nobody else has it. Right, it's not in the Constitution. Because, the islands. no, but, that, though? because when we were making our Constitution, they wanted to prevent what happened to um, the guy from Frente Obrero, um, um, Codet, Codet, Anthony Codet. He was sitting in prison, but yet holding a seat in Parliament. Correct. So they said, no, um, to prevent that happening, we're going to put oh. in that you get suspended. Copy paste it. But Kyoto doesn't have it, and it happened in Kyoto. Right. Holland doesn't have it. Aruba doesn't have it. So why did we? Have, why because did we, we this law then? We didn't have that. We just have people that want to play important and don't understand mm -hmm. the consequences of a law. And, and this is a perfect example. of Great that. example. And well, not only you, but previous uh, members of Parliament also. The problem is this: you're you're elected by the public, the people of Samaritan, yet your law. A judge now to decide who sits in your parliament. That that's what it is. Say that something. But listen, they got, all they gotta do is charge a few more people, hold them for ten days or more in jail, mm -hmm. and they all lose their seats. Yeah. Because our law allows this. Only we do these things. What were we thinking? I, I can't tell you. I really can't tell you because it is not democracy. Mm -hmm. Because the ICCR speaks out against that. And when I had filed my complaint at Parliament, Parliament asked the Council of Advice, they said they don't give advice on, on, on personal matters. But it, was, it wasn't a personal matter. Right. It was a constitutional matter. But everybody ducking. And in a situation like this, MP also costs the country more money too because when, a, exactly. when, when you take an MP, for, for example, you take a, an elected official, put him into office and then kicks him out, he goes home, continues to get paid and exactly. you somebody else. There exactly. Again. Exactly. I, I think it's totally ridiculous. And, but to come back to yeah. the article, the article right. states that you are suspended and then when the term ends, it's over. Because I don't know if I'm going to be re-elected or not. But if I'm re-elected, you can't punish me again for the same thing. That's what double, our law says. Double jeopardy. Exactly. Our yeah. law clearly yeah. states That's it. But jeopardy. this is when you don't know the law, mm -hmm. you read an article, and they start running him out. Yeah. That's the problem in this country. Because... That's what the Daily Herald told me. Yeah, that's why they had right that I was banned for three years. Are you serious? The verdict didn't say, so you decide to write it. And then, oops, it was a mistake. No, it's not a mistake. It was intentional. Just like how the same reporter did with Olivier's case. And said that that's Christopher's political advisor. So yes, there were, there are collusions to keep me out. They're targeting. The party is basically what you're saying, right? Yes. Now. Because we are the one party that is not afraid to call a spade a spade. We are the one party that ain't afraid to tell them, we don't need your money. We're going to do without it. Mm -hmm. This is a problem. And this is now festering among some of the established parties. But that's okay. Our broads are back. Yeah, we got broad backs. Mm -hmm. We ain't afraid of this. Right. It's going to come, it's going to be exposed, and we're going to move on. That's how simple it is for me. But you know, Grace, I think I have given you... you, you you're you running, of course, and then you, yeah. once elected, you are taking up your seat. Naturally, Grace, I, I'm going to be one of the 15. No ifs and buts about that. I'm trying to be in the top five vote getters of the country. That's my aim. I'm really pushing hard for it because people do believe in me. And people have now started realizing the abuse that they are doing against me to keep me out because I don't have to prove who I am. I have 33 years doing civic service. I have 25 years in public office. I have proven my value. Mm -hmm. I have the knowledge of how government works. I understand the laws. That makes me not an asset, but a liability for certain parties and certain people. Correct. That's what it is. No more, no less. All right.
Now, MP20, back in 2020, you campaigned on the legis uh, legalizing uh, medicinal cannabis. This morning on the front page of the paper, we see where uh, Member of Parliament MP Rayon Peterson raised questions about the Minister of Public Health, Social Affairs and Labor VSA Omar Atli's lack of transparency in the cannabis legislation or legalization tender process. You briefly spoke about this last week also. Again. I'm going to state it again for the record. It's a scam. It's a complete scam. You cannot set a tender in such a way that nobody locally can compete. I told them I campaigned on it, and I'm going to say it again. The whole cannabis industry is for the local man. If the local man can't benefit from this, but we want to bring in Canadians to benefit from it, we are cutting our own throats. This is a pillar that will strengthen agriculture beyond um, our, our, our um, ability financially. Next week, I'm going to be speaking on this program about the new Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, and Animal Husbandry, how that ties in with this whole cannabis production that we want to do legally on this island. Okay. I begged the Minister, I'm going to use the word, I begged the Minister of Justice from when I got in four years ago, Please work on the tolerance policy so that we stop locking up fellas that walk on a little weed or smoking a little weed. Mm -hmm. And there were a hundred reasons and excuses. We're going to get a committee together. We're going to do this. Then suddenly out of left field, you see the minister of ASI come in. With, he come in with a proposal for uh, a request for proposal to, to do cannabis. And it's only foreigners involved. And I'm saying to myself, because I know... I think it was Denisio, not, not Denisio, Ras Bushman and them, with their group that has been talking about cannabis for years. Correct. Looked at it and said, but we can't do nothing with this. We have everything made up, gave it to the government. They were there. Huh? They still had it out, veered out. Which company come in here to do work for free? Set up all legislations, they ain't getting nothing. Mm -hmm. Santa Claus there a long time. And even the we, locals, would, if, they, if they do it, they, they should said, pay the, lo also. the locals, they grow it. They import it, they sell it, they go to jail for it. Now we can legalize it and have them become millionaires because this is a trillion dollar business. That ain't good enough for our people. They're not qualified for that. Right. And then they say, you decide? Yeah, we're going to decide on the 11th. Go home. Because this is crazy. Our people have a right to become the new kings by the bank. We don't need a Canadian company to be the king by the bank. Our own, be it Dutch Quarter, Soccer Garden, Middle Region, KB, St. Peter's, Colby, I don't care where they come from. But our own people should be the ones taking the steer on this whole cannabis journey St. Martin is going right. to make. Right. Antigua got it. Grenada got it. St. Kitts got it. St. Vincent got it. Totola got it. You know who he got it? The damn fools in St. Martin. Because we want to give it to the Canadians. And that's what we believe is right. And we are such a sick people if we do that. So you 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 are going to come, you're, you're still campaigning on that. Right? Naturally. But right. by now, the people on the block know who the genuine be and who the one. Listen, giving people you know, little parties and singing songs and jumping up, they can get you elected, you know. Because people are still hungry. Right now, they went out boasted. I raised minimum wage. I raised this. I... 75% of the public of St. Martin is living in poverty. Pong your chest on that. Tell them that's what you did in four years. Oh, how you fix the hospital. Fix what? Throw more concrete? And they get implicated in a house deal? Please, man, stop it. Don't, don't, let us not go down this road. I don't campaign this way. I campaign factually. You know, I came here today to talk also about tax reform. Yeah. You know, that's, that's how, 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 yeah, how, how, how this going to go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in St. Martin, we just had the amended budget in the Central Committee. The, it, it finished yesterday. And in there, you notice that the surplus of 23 million went to 22 million. So there's a surplus of a million because there was a lot of extra costs government had, including four and a half million by Vromi for additional contracts and all that. So mm -hmm. you can see where the campaign money trail is. And we're going to talk about some yeah. pensions that also will be taxed. We're we going to get there just now. Okay. But again, when it comes to the tax reform, it is needed sooner than later. You know, when I saw the political billboard of the Minister of Finance wishing everybody 
happy holidays when he single-handedly has been destroying the seniors by allowing them to be taxed day in, day out. And you know, Grace, you know what's a hurtful thing? When you hear them talking about, oh, we're going to pay you out everything we owe you on the AOV raise in December. We, ain't going to, we, we couldn't do it now because then you'd have money for Christmas and you'd have a nice Christmas. We're going to do it at the end of December. But come, and listen to the BS because then you won't get tax heavy. Now, let me explain something. There are two types of taxes that people pay. Huh? Wage tax <clears throat> and income tax. Preach. That's it. So if I get paid in December, I can pay the wage tax on it. If I get paid in January, I can pay the wage tax on it. If I get paid in December, I can pay the income tax over 2023. If I get it in, Dece in January, I can pay it over 2024. The same tax I can pay. So let us not talk stupidness to people and believe nobody going to react to it. Because I going to react to it. That's the type of person I am. We got to be honest when we talk to people about their livelihood. Stop boasting about BS when people are hungry and don't have food to eat. That's why I stated in my campaign, any money I get from any donor, I am going to buy food vouchers. I am going to give it to organizations so they can give it to their people. They don't need to know from who it come. Right. Just here, there is some money. Go and get yourself something for Christmas. Anonymous but, donor. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So the organizations will have it. Correct. But we need to decide honestly what this campaign is about. Is it about billboards or is it about people? Is it showing how much money we have? Or is it about helping people? You know, again, we need to understand no, that nothing has really been done to help the people in this country. When 75 to 80% of the customers of NVGB own OGB bills, OGB money, it tells you where your country stands. I just told you, 75% is living in poverty. 75 to 80% OGB. But we're doing good. We're doing great. No, we are not. As country, we are not. And that's why tax reform was so important. And with the swipe of a pen, the Minister of Finance could have taken care of the seniors. But he opted not to. That's the message. We, we, we got to stop running around doing all kinds of things. Look, we need to truly think on how we take loans to go build roads or we take loans to do agriculture or build government buildings so that we don't have to pay rent. We just go on there now to pay $27,000 uh, $27, on Front Street for rent. Beautiful building. Nothing wrong with the building. Don't misunderstand me. I, I even understand how nice it is. But, you know, that building could have been bought maybe for $3 million and you would have owned it. Now we're going to pay $2 million for five years. Mm -hmm. This is the problem. We continuously go into rental agreements, fattening a third party's pocket. We can take 50 million as a loan and build a parliament building that you pay 2 million for a year. Within 25 years, that's paid back. That building is 50 years. So you got 25, mil, 25 years of 2 million profit. That's 50 million. So on the fifth, but the building don't cost 50 million, it costs 10 million. Then you build the high councils, you build a justice wing. So you go get the people out of the the courthouse and mm -hmm. put them in the justice wing and make that a national museum instead of having the museum, sea mark and all them in a little container or in a little store down in the arcade on Front Street. These are the type of things that you take, you have to take loans that give a return on investment. If you take loans to build roads, to fix roads, you, you're not getting a return on investment. I, I, I believe um, in the past that government did speak about um, moving away from paying these high rents and actually have all the, the government-owned companies, businesses, like, you know, like the, the courthouse, no, the no. office and everything, in one, in one establishment. They just took 61 million guilders in a loan to do capital investment. Nothing in there is returning money to the coffers. Mm -hmm. So you just... Um, put a burden on a generation to come for a loan that comes 20 years from today. So my grandchildren that are six years now, when they are 26, they'll be paying for that loan. That's what we just did to fix roads that next year mash up again. 
they, these are the things that we, if they had taken that money and told me, we are going to use this to do the whole tax system. And by doing the tax system we, and do something else. Look, we are saying that in our current system, we have a lot of taxes. Eh? We have income tax that variates from 12% to 47.5%. Do you see that 47.5%? That's what they're going to tax the seniors on the extra money they're going to give them. From the, uh, the retroactive pension Yes, payment, sir. Because right? it is a bizondere battalion. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, just like yeah. when you get vacation allowance, that's what it is hit you. When you get Christmas bonus, that's what it is hit you. So this is the problem. We have profit tax, 34.5%. Tax holiday between two and ten percent. But you did you like while you're talking about this, explain to seniors in layman's language, like we say, like break it down for them to really understand because I I have it like for, yeah. for them that if Santa Claus came early, yes, we get all this money. You get the ninety if if it is correct, you get the ninety eight guilders maximum a month extra mm -hmm. for twelve months. Which would then give you approximately because I know I made a calculation on it and it's not in this system. Of, uh, I think it's about 1,100 guilders. Right. You will get retroactive pay mm -hmm. onto your existing pay. Okay. Let's say your existing pay was because you had the full kitten caboodle, which was 1,224. It means the 1,224 is not taxable because it's be below minimum wage. Not around 1,100. So you automatically become taxable. Fall, fall in that tax range, right? Now you fall in the tax range. And they will say, but wait, that payment is an extraordinary payment. So we gotta take 47% from it. So you might be going home with 550 and a half percent because it's an extraordinary payment. It's so a back pay. So they're gonna see less money in their next the they're, going to, they're going to get about five, 600 guilders out of the total. They will lose 500, about half is gone. Wow. This is what nobody wants to tell the people. Yeah. In lump sum payments, you always lose. That's why it would have been better to pay them the 98 guilders, not in a lump sum, Increment. but over monthly, yes. because the 13, 20, the 13, 38 that it was going to become, mm -hmm. even if you add on the 98 guilders a month, retroactive, you would have stayed below the minimum wage, so you want the paid pension. Seniors, are you listening? So instead of them helping the seniors, they're screwing the seniors. But then again, this has always been their style. They don't care about the seniors. They pretend they do. They put on Santa Claus hat and take poster pictures. But that don't put food on the seniors' table. That's the bottom line. And I know some of them will get upset with me. And so I, 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 do, I, do, I, I campaign it wrong. No, I just want people to understand the truth. Understand what it's really all about. Because the seniors are going to take a serious hit this, um, on, on this payment because... It is a lump sum payment mm -hmm. and it will be taxed different than wage tax. I told you wage tax starts at 12% up to 47 and a half. And that 47 and a half is an extra payment that you get. Right. That's how they do it. Okay. <clears throat> we have dividend tax here that only when you get money out of a company as an owner, you pay. Now, nobody never gets money. Turnover tax is 5%. And there are some restrictions that are applied. Uh, some um, special exemptions, like casinos don't pay 5% turnover tax. They pay just uh, a monthly fee. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, those type of things. Then you have the accommodations, room tax, that is 5%. You have the transfer and real estate um, tax, that's 4%. You have property tax that exists but not applied. This is something they should take off the books, take it out as a law. Right. But before some Toro go in there and he let IMF or CFT force them to apply it, Otherwise, the Kingdom Council will put some kind of regulation on them because that's how these things work. Mm -hmm. So get it off the books. If, there's, if it's not a law, they can't make it a law. And they can't force Parliament to make it a law. But they don't think. They just simply sometimes don't think. And then, you know, you have um, timeshare fee and payroll tax, which is wage tax, AVBZ, AOV, and ZV. Mm -hmm. Now, these are all things that I took off of the, the, the net. Now, to, to, to do this, we have to look, to change the tax law, you have to look at the budget cycle of the country and see how you're going to incorporate and keep considerations. Now, we have a few things that we believe if you do the taxes this way, everybody is going to carry the burden. And that means not only those registered at the tax office, no, everybody will pay their fair share of the country. We want to do a corporate import duty of 8%. 
in collaboration with the French side. The French side has agreed to this. The Dutch side reached over there to sign water deals that already exist. But they don't want to go over there to sign the import duties. They want to continue forcing the turnover tax so of five percent. The, the water deal had already exists. You said. You know how long GB has been sending over water? The electricity can go over because a, a car hit the, the, the step up transformer by the border and mashed it up. Okay. But GB has always been able to send over water already mm. through Bellevue and Oyster Pond. Now they are looking at Belvedere and. Um, Kupkoi to see if they can send through water there okay. onto, the, onto the net of um, the French side. It is more because GB deals directly with the French side water company. Right. What the two governments are doing is they're saying they're doing a cooperation agreement. But remember, the Treaty of Concordia allows free movement of goods and people. So if GB, who manages the water on behalf of the government of Samaritan, wants to sell it to the French side, which they have done in the past already, mm -hmm. before this minister was even in office signing our documents, and they were making money on it, it just continued. Okay. That's, that's all it is. All right. It's nice to jump on the front page, but the truth is, it was there before. Mm -hmm. It's just a formalization now. Then, you have the import. We are saying, if a merchant imports stuff, he pays 8%. If you want to import stuff on your own, to Amazon and so you pay nine and a half percent. Because if we don't protect the merchants, if we don't protect the economy, then we, why are we even giving business licenses? Let everybody right. just import everything from Walgreens, Walmart, Amazon, wherever. Yeah. Then you don't need stores. Mm -hmm. You don't need to put people to pay, put everybody backside on social welfare. Yeah, but we're paying taxes by the merchants. Naturally, here. naturally. You pay, tax on it. you pay the five percent Turnover tax, and depending if it's gasoline, for example, you're paying 10% legally mm -hmm. because the, you have the retailer and the distributor. But, you know, for when one person sells to the other, to the other, every time that 5% is going up, so you pay five times 15%. We are saying, no, put a um, import duty mm -hmm. to the merchants, and that's where the money is collected. It's collected the minute the goods reach here and it leaves the port, you're paying for it. Okay. It's a one-time payment. Government gets that money. Fixed now, rate? 8%. 8% based on what you import it on. Because whatever you import it on is also what you can sell it for. Mm -hmm. You ain't jacking up the price of how expensive it was. No, I have your bill of lading. Right. So you want to drop the price thinking and pay less, you're going to sell it for less too because this is where we feel price control in the stores. Yeah. If your markup is a maximum of 20% or 25% based on whatever it is government sets, then that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And that's what we got to check. But we don't do that. Well, do, we, do you believe, though, MP, that uh, some of the, the businesses are passing on the, the, the <laughs> some of those taxes on to the consumers? If I believe. Okay. But that's factual, for God's sakes. Okay. All right. Anytime you see price changes, mm -hmm. zero fuel went up, GB bill reached something, <laughs> price change in the store. And that's why right now, when they're checking the basket of goods, they're finding businesses left, right, and center. But it was not being controlled. Thank you. You it said it. It was not being controlled. You said it. But they were working so hard. Yeah. Let me call my water people out there. We need some more water here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things we also want to do is yeah. create an implementation of a half percent on transaction tax. We have about 11 billion go through our banks. We do nothing for it. So if we say there's a half a percent transaction tax, it means you're making some serious money. Because remember, uh, a billion is a thousand million. It's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So a half a percent can easily bring you up to 100, 150 million, 200 million guilders easily. So this is money that the central bank will send to you. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to put the control agencies. The banks have to report to the central government what going through their banks. Half a percent is going to be taken off of every transaction. So if I send money from one account to somebody else's account, I pay for that it's a transaction. Mm -hmm. So the half a percent then goes to government. It's a way of bringing in money. Our problem is we have to, in the tax reform, also ensure that there's a quality control on merchandising that we don't only get lower quality stuff right. here, forcing people to buy outside because right. they believe, thank you, thank they you believe so they believe that the quality of the merchandise is so bad that they have to go and buy it outside. Mm -hmm. 
corporate tax incentives. You know, we're talking about tax holiday for this. Time. What about giving tax holiday to your own people? Think, think, think simply. Farming, whatever farming it is, recycling, affordable housing. If five people want to come together with land and say, listen, we together, we got a million guilders in the bank. We want to buy 10 apartments, build 10 apartments. Give them a tax break. You're giving it to the hotels and all of them for 10 years. Give them a tax break. Be it for five years, be it for 10 years. They're building the homes that we need. Because the government can't build it. The government said they were going to build a thousand last time. They didn't build one. They come with all kind of fancy ideas, but they ain't building nothing. But give people a chance to get a tax break, to do this, and then you have something working in your favor. And the money actually circulates right back into our coffers. Thank you. Phase out mm -hmm. the corporate profit tax over five years from 34.5% to 12.5%. People will pay them. Because right now, they got so many different bookkeepings because nobody go walk, make money and then get a government 34 and a half. I can't tell you do it to zero because then they say you're doing money laundering. <laughs> yeah, but the Dutch gonna say that right go away. That too. Then they gonna tell you, oh, you're, 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 you're what? A mafia paradise. I mean, yeah. you, you know, so you, you gotta be careful. Mm -hmm. I'm saying these are the things you gotta watch. Right. You know, phase out tax holidays also, but create for the local market, a tax exemption for an X amount of years. Mm -hmm. And the tax exemption is basically on the profit. Eh? It's not on your wage taxes. You pay all the other wage taxes, but profit tax you don't pay mm -hmm. because you can continue reinvesting and moving on. Moving on with that. When it comes to game of chance, we're talking here you now lotteries, casinos, all those type of things. Increase the fee. Collect the license fee. Establish the gaming board. For the past... 13 years since we are country Samantha and I've only heard stories why we haven't done it thus far. And limit the licenses also. Naturally, licenses. naturally. And the amount of boots you have outside. Mm -hmm. And that is not because I don't have an issue with gambling. I think we need to control gambling that it is uh how would I say it's a fun something. Control what about a, 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 a gambling control board? That's the gaming board. Right. Okay, the gaming board. Do we we don't have one here, do we? No. I know there's one in Curacao. Up to now, right. we are trying to get it done. Like I said, put a cap on the issuance of the licenses. <coughs> and something that many people tell me, don't say that, you guys have trouble. Relocate all standalone casinos into hotels. If it is not a hotel, there's no need for the casino. Why is that? Because the casinos are not catering to the tourists. They're catering to the local population. Okay. Remember, when you go to certain casinos... These are the standalone in, casinos. The standalone casinos. Yeah, I'm referring to standalone casinos. Okay. They should be in hotels. We have a policy. Hotels with 200 rooms or more, we have a right to a casino. So if we have hotels here with 200 rooms or more that don't have a casino, they have a right to get a casino. We are giving out standalone casinos. We have about 10 standalone casinos. They are only servicing the local population, not the tourists. We brought casinos to St. Martin for tourists. Mm -hmm. It was a leisure something. Right. I think Julian Roloff always said it in his program, Wealth, Wealth and Health, mm -hmm. that you have to um, control how you gamble. You can gamble what you because can afford. Addiction. It is a major addiction. It's, addiction. it's a major addiction in St. Martin among the population. Yeah, the, the machine when it hits the even in the e brain. That's why Las Vegas is called Sin City. Yeah. Because you commit sins to get money to gamble. Mm -hmm. Because it's just like a drug or alcohol. Right. You know, and some people even said they have sex addictions. You know, this is what it is, Grace. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we really have to work it. Um, look at this. You know, the fees for all these lottery locations. Everybody's a branch, but they just pay for one office. And all the branches, basically, because they've got hundreds of branches out there. And seemingly, they don't pay for them. Vehicle disposal fee. we got car wrecks all over the place. Why can't we make a legislation... Every car imported into this country is $250. And when the car is exported, you bring the exportation papers to customs so you can get a paper to go and collect the $250. Other than that thing, will work. And French side don't count. Free movement of people and goods, they don't come. Because when that wreck come back over, I ain't got no money to pick it up. Mm -hmm. So we're going to leave it. When it's Just important, it right yes, you're paying for it. Right. Now, 
I hear the minister say you can make 400,000 by doing maritime and all that. Utter nonsense. We need to do this with Holland. We are not ready for it, but we can do it. Think on a condo fee. 0.75% 7, on a condo fee where villas that are owned by corporations, not by locals, by corporations, that they pay because they're making money with it. They're doing Airbnb and all these type of VRBO and nothing. Mm -hmm. But the house, can, you can't pick up the house and go with it, Grace. True. So true. You, you can't pick it up and run with it. <laughs> so I'm going to tax the asset. Mm -hmm. So the whole private foundations pay 75%. 0.75% of their asset, so will those villas owned by corporations. Same thing. It can be done. The, the room tax is 5%. I'm saying increase it to 10. It goes to government. And the other 2%, though, that goes to the Nature Foundation to ensure that environmental protection can find its way someplace. I like that. We need to put money into these type of things if we really want to talk about we are environmentally conscious mm -hmm. because we are not we speak on this side of our mouth about climate change and on this side of our mouth we speak about something totally different do you have anyone representing us right now in um in the at the at the, the i think it's a cop 28 conference curacao is there it's about the infra, environmental um basically you have like 20 something thousand uh Countries actually participating in, I can't, in I, Dubai right now. I, I can't tell you. I really, I, I, I know I saw Lisa Uton was one of the chairpersons. Yeah, yeah. I know that I heard that Samantha was there. I really can't tell you. Okay, I really, really right. can't tell you. You know, look, I think the other big thing that we have to look at is syntax. Excise tax on distributors of sugary beverages, liquor, tobacco, nicotine, mm -hmm. and also cannabis when legalized. This money can be placed into an awareness of healthy living, so a wellness fund, but also you support agriculture, fisheries, and animal husbandry, because that's a new ministry we want to form. If you create taxes on liquors and all these things, that money can be funneled to that ministry to ensure we have something. So mm -hmm. you see, Grace, we're not just coming with nice talk. We're coming with solutions, solutions. that right. can make this happen. Listen, tax reform has been discussed for years. You don't have to reinvent it. We just got to fine tune it and do what we got to do, Grace. Right. St. Martin needs a change. The No Party is offering that change. Our manifesto was the first manifesto out. We didn't hide what we want to do and, and say we're going to show it later. No. Ask the other parties. Where is the government's manifesto? Where's the up manifesto? Where's the NA manifesto? DP pulled out something now. Right. PFP, PFP pulled out something now. Right. But where, where's the government? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, there are flags and posters. You, you spoke about the, the billboards. Also you know, that, uh, Grace, you that, that, that. that's a complete joke. Because, like they said, and I said it before, I'll say it again. There will be no movement of any billboard by anybody from Vromi or the police until the budget passed. Now, remember, what they passed thus far is the Central Committee. So they're going to make a report now, and next week, the budget debates will start. So consider maybe by next weekend, if the budget passed, that the instruction will be given to take down all billboards in the roundabouts. I want to congratulate the USRM, the chair lady of the board, made sure that her candidates moved their stuff out of the roundabouts. Okay, they did. Yes. All right. But the other the other parties, the, 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 the ones that are involved in this, uh, they did not. Nothing. They believe yes. they're in government, you know, might is right, and they're going to do what they want. It's, it's unfortunate, but it is what it is, Grace, you know. Um, also, the integrity chamber now has taken up the plight of the concerned taxi drivers and bus drivers. There's going to be a hearing, I believe, tomorrow or today or tomorrow, tomorrow. with the integrity chamber. These people now. The, also, I read the, it yesterday. Yeah, the ombudsman jump in now too. Right. They too are going to look and do a, a, a whole um, review of what's happening there. Right. So you know, th there are a lot of things. Did, did you read the assessment or not? Is it on, GB? on GB? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And and okay. did you history. did you read of the course. bottom how the political oh, the political, the political interference, interference yeah. in how the management should be selected? It is mm -hmm. absurd. Those four pointers, but that last one that really caught me. 
the political You can remember what he said? I'm just sitting down here um, to witness what's happening in GB. No, you were the orchestrator of the stupidity that went down that put GB in a the position they are today. Yeah. But then he ran and went to hide and sent the Prime Minister to defend his case in GB. You see? But we talk about cowards. We'll be back next week. But we talk about cowards. We'll be back next week. You know we're going to be back we'll next be week. We'll be back next week. The Wednesday, the Wednesday power hour yeah. is on. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> Definitely. And my guest, of course, is none other than uh, MP. MP number two is the number two candidate, also the deputy leader of the now party, Mr. Claudius Juan Camper. Any uh, closing words before we go? Yes, Grace. Um, I hope I clarified that I can run, I can be elected, and I can take my seat. Contrary to what some people are trying to sell a narrative out there, that I cannot run and I can't take my seat. Hogwash. If you don't know the law, hush your mouth. Take it what Bunk said. I take in my seat come January 11th when I'm elected because I will be elected. To the people of St. Martin that still believe in me, thank you so very much. To the hundreds of people that have called me after my verdict, send me WhatsApps, prayers. I have prayer groups them praying for me and telling me, Mr. Van Camper, you're a man of integrity. You stand your ground. You're not afraid to fight. People like you, we need in Parliament, not flag wavers and pounding chests of what they have done that really doesn't feed the people of Samantha. So with grace with that, you know, I'm confident. I have a lot of um, belief. I want to thank my family for standing headstrong with me. You know, my son is, is a warrior. You know, I want to tell him and my daughter, thank you so much. My wife has always been by my side, you know, so, and my brother, you know, they, they, they stand with me, you know, um, sometimes, it's difficult because you hear a lot of things out here, you know. I am this and I am that. But Grace, if I was all that, I wouldn't have been a parliamentarian. I would have been the owner of St. Martin. Because right. that's how they try to make me. They try to make me some king that I am not. I'm just a humble civil servant that became a parliamentarian that has never shied away from opening his mouth and calling a spade a spade. But always, always delivered whatever work he had to deliver. That's me. In a nutshell. Monks, my guest this morning in the Breakfast Lounge. Thank you so much. And you'll be back with me tomorrow, uh, next week again, next yes. Wednesday. So, radio listeners, again, uh, we're a bit over time here this morning, but nevertheless, it was all worth it. Um, my number two candidate um, in the Breakfast Lounge this morning of the Now Party, uh, Claudius Toncho Bon Camper, affectionately known as Monks. Enjoy the rest of the day. we got the news coming up next, followed by Joanne Lewis. And